Hey everyone, welcome. Today we're going to talk about random variables and expectation. Um, to start, if you could please get your homework out. Um, I'm obviously not here to talk about it, uh, but if you could spend a couple minutes going over that together. If anybody has any questions, please help each other out. If there are things that you cannot solve without me, then either take a picture of them with your phone if you have stuff up here, and I will help you with them next time. So let's get people um, asking some questions. Go ahead and pause the video now um, so you can do that, and then when that's concluded, go ahead and start again. Hey, I'm still here. So um, let's start talking about random variables and expectation. A random variable, simply put, is just some sort of an experiment or some sort of a trial that can take on some sort of an outcome. Um, we'll deal with expectation in a minute, um, but let's get started with random variables. They often are denoted with a capital letter. Um, most commonly for us, it's going to be a capital X or a Y, and it's some measurable quantity. So an example we're going to look at today is if we flip a coin, how many times do we get heads? So for example, you flip a coin three times, how many times do you get heads? Well, there's only so many things that can happen. You could get heads zero times, one time, two times, or three times. That's it. So that's the measurability of it. They are whole numbers in this case. Um, any single event, so for example, uh, like getting one heads would be noted, would be denoted as x. So let's get into an example and look at how these data are represented. So we'll do an example where we throw a coin four times. And for us, we'll make big X the number of times that heads appears. Oops, sorry about that. The number of times that heads appears. And so we get this funny notation right here. And then we've got this as well down here again. So all this is saying, the probability that we actually achieve some value. So take a minute, look at the table. You may want to copy down the table. It's got three rows there. And we've got all of our outcomes, zero heads, one, two, three, four heads. Frequency, how many times each of those pops up. And we're going to use that information to calculate the probability. So go ahead, take a moment, and write down the table. So to keep the video short today, I'm not going to take real long pauses like I would normally in class. So if you have questions, then just pause the video. If I'm going too fast and people need time to write stuff down, that's totally fine. Just pause the video. The video is going to be much shorter than the length of class, and so you should have plenty of time to pause um, if needed. And it's online, so if you don't have enough time to finish in class today, you could always finish watching at home. Ooh, exciting. All right, let's get back to here. So for ours, we're throwing the coin four times, and these are all the possible outcomes. Now, we're going to need some sort of a visual trick to understand what the probabilities of each of those are. And so that's the next thing I'm going to introduce today that's new, something called a tree diagram. So, tree diagram. And this is going to represent all the possible outcomes that can happen when we flip a coin four times. So, first time we flip a coin, what can happen? Well, two things. On our first flip, we could get heads, or we could get tails. Now, assuming that it's a fair coin, which for our example, we'll assume that, those have an equal probability. So, a probability of one half that you get heads, and a probability of one half that you get tails. Okay, first coin flip is done. Let's go to the second coin flip. On the second coin flip, two things could happen. You could get heads, or you could get tails. But if you flipped tails the first time, once again, you could get heads, or you could get tails. Each of these has a probability of one half. Half heads, half tails, half heads, half tails. Now we know the probability adds up to one, and it might look like right now a half plus a half plus a half plus a half is two. And I get that might be weird for now, but wait until we get to the very end of the tree diagram, and I'll show you how it does actually add up to one like we know it should. So now we're at our first flip, maybe we should label that. So this is flip one, this is flip two, these are the outcomes. Let's keep going. So let's go to flip three. On flip three, you could get heads or you could get tails. And I'm going to add this for all of these branches, what they call it a tree diagram. It's branching out as we go. Heads, tails, heads, tails. That was flip 
three. All right, so the tree is growing exponentially. First we had two outcomes, now we have four, now we have eight. I bet you know how many will be in the next one. Yes, 16. All right, so let's continue. On to the last one. In each of these branches, we could end our last throw with a head or a tail. So excuse me for a moment while I fill those in. All right, so take a moment, complete your tree diagram, because we're about to use this, and I want to show you how easy it is to go from the tree diagram back up to the probability distribution table. If we're all good there, let's go back up and look at what our question is we're trying to answer. We're asked to fill in this frequency table, so let's take a look at our tree diagram, and let's look first at all the different ways that we can get zero. Hmm, what was X again? I think it was heads. Let's see. Where does it say here? The probability that we get heads X times. So the number of times, or how often in that table we get heads zero times. So what I'm looking for in the tree diagram, I'm looking for branches that have heads appear zero times. And I only see one of those branches, the one that starts here and where we get tails, 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 tails. That's our four coin flips. So that is the one branch, only occurs one time, where we have no heads. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say that that occurs one time. Okay, let's go down again. Now I want to look for all the branches where heads occurs one time. And so I'm just going to start tracing through the branches and see what happens. So I'm going to use a highlighter so we can highlight these as we go. If I look at the top one, I have heads one, two, three, four times. Okay, that's obviously not it. Next branch. Heads, heads. Okay, let's, that's out. We've already got two heads. Heads, tails, heads. Okay, that's out. Heads, tails, tails, tails. So that's the end of a branch right there. Trace it again. Heads, tails, tails, tails. Heads only occurred one time. We have to find all the branches that do that. So if you want to pause the video here and look for the other ones, you can. Or I'm going to keep going. So now I'm looking down here, looks like tails, 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 heads, that's one of them. Looks like tails, heads, tails, tails is one of them. And I think there's one more. Tails, tails, heads, tails. I believe there's only four of them. And the other thing we could do, and if you prefer this labeling, and try it, is you could write ones next to these. That's the number of times that heads occurs in each one of them. You say, okay, there's one, two, three, four of them. Let's go back up to the table and fill in that new piece of information. That occurred four times. Okay. We're going to continue doing this until this table is filled out, and then we'll see how easy it is to fill in our probabilities. Okay. And actually, I'm going to take a shortcut here. It looks to me like two is probably going to occur the most times. Zero didn't occur much. I'm guessing it's going to be unlikely that in four coin flips we're going to get heads all four times. So I'm actually going to go to the other end of the table now and work my way backward. And so I want to see what I get when I do that. So I'm looking for four heads. I only see one place where that happens. And that is right here. Heads, 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 heads. There's only one way that, that occurs. And so I can fill that in in my table right now, and I've only got to fill in two more spaces. So I'm going to go for the three right now. Just from experience, I'm thinking three is going to be easier because two is going to happen the most often. Half the time we get heads. So I'm looking for branches that have three, and I'm actually just going to label them with threes this time. So three heads. Let's see. Heads, 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 tails. Okay, that one has three. Heads, heads, tails, heads. That one has three. Heads, tails, heads, heads. That one has three. And what am I missing? I should be missing one. Tails, heads, heads, heads. That one has three. And so there are four of them. Now, I want to do this in the easiest way possible. So rather than, I mean, one way we could do it, we could go back and count all the ones that we didn't mark. So anything I didn't put a mark next to, that's going to have two. We've exhausted all of our options. So I could count that. looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, and then that one's the one that had zero. So there are six. Another way we could look at that, notice in this first row, we had two outcomes. In the second one, one, two, three, four. We had said this was exponential. 
Then there's 8 and, like you said, 16. So, if there's 16 in this one, so far our numbers add up to, well look, that's 5 and that's 5. Add them together, you get 10. They have to total 16, so that's 6. There's 16 branches. So with that said, let's turn these into probabilities now. Well, this only happened one time out of 16. That's a 1 in 16 probability. 4 times out of 16, that's a 4 in 16 probability, or 1 fourth. You're going to notice on your assignment today, when I have the solutions, I have the simplified answers in most cases. So if you're looking and go, what the heck did he do? Well, I just simplified the answers, and I'm not leaving it as 4 sixteenths. Here we've got 6 over 16, which we better known as 3 eighths. 4 over 16, we already know that's 1 fourth, and then 1 sixteenth. So that is our complete table. We also have a command here. They want us to draw it as a histogram. So if we were to draw this as a histogram, it's probably, I'm assuming you might have learned this in like 5th or 6th grade. And so that's just going to look like this. Probabilities go up as high as 1, although I'm noticing in our table the biggest number is 3 eighths. So I'm going to label this top number here as 1 half. This is our probability. So one half in the middle of that is one fourth, in the middle of that is one eighth, in the middle of that is one sixteenth, and then down across the bottom, I'm going to put my well, my x values. Look, it's even x values across the bottom. So zero, one, two, three, four. And for our histogram, all we have to do is put in these numbers. So one sixteenth for my first one, shade it in. For the next one, one fourth. So up to one-fourth and over, and please excuse my inconsistency in width. They should be the same width, but you know what, this is what you get. And we get three-eighths on the next one. Three-eighths is up here, so I'm going to go up to three-eighths. One-fourth. Oops. And one-sixteenth. Okay, and there's our histogram. Um, from my drawing, it may not be that easy to tell, but look, it's... A symmetrical distribution. It's not skewed. Okay, so now we've looks like we've completed our prompt. Let's continue. Okay, now we're given another situation. We're going to practice another one. And I'll read it to you. I don't know if you can read from where you're at because I don't know how high the video recording is or how high quality it is. So here it is. Two marbles are chosen at random from a box that has two red and six green marbles. So there's eight total. Make a table of the possible values of x and their probabilities. Let's define x as number of red marbles. And so with that, our table is going to look like this. So, how many marbles could we pull? Well, we could pull zero red marbles, we could pull one, or we could pull two. And so, once again, I want to do this the easiest way possible. So, I'm going to start thinking about, well, what would happen if I pulled out zero red marbles? Well, the first marble I pull, what is the probability of not pulling a red marble? That would be the probability of pulling a green marble. So, I'm going to write it like this. The probability that x is zero. There's zero, probability that x is zero. So what would I have to do? I'd have to reach in and pull out a green. Well, there's six greens out of the eight. And when I grab for the second one, there's not going to be six greens anymore. There's going to be five, and there's only seven. This is a without replacement situation. Let's multiply those together and see what we get. Looks like we get 30 out of 56. Should probably simplify that down. So it looks like that goes to 15 and... What is that? 28? Ooh, if I get that wrong, you better help me out. So that's 28. I'm not sure if that simplifies right now, so I'm going to leave that as 15 over 28. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, to me, it sounds a little bit easier to deal with two, because there's multiple different ways you could pull out one red marble. You could pull it out on your first draw, or you could pull it out on your second draw. So we'd have to calculate two probabilities and add them together. 
I don't want to do that. So let's do the simpler version. Let's figure out the probability of pulling a 2. Oops, so probability, excuse me for a moment, probability that x equals 2. Okay, so if we pulled out two red marbles, that means the first marble is red and the second marble is red. So I reach in, there are two red marbles out of the eight, and I reach in again, and now there is only one out of seven red marbles. And so let's see, multiply them together, and you get two out of 56. Simplify that down, one out of 28. That might be confusing at first, but if you think about it, it makes sense that we would have a lower likelihood of pulling both red marbles out, because there's only two of them. All right, let's put that in the table. So I'm not actually going to have to do a complex calculation here, because remember, these all add up to one. And if those all add up to one, I just have to find the missing number here that makes that happen. So I take 15 over 28, plus 1 over 28, that is 16 over 28. So what's missing? If I added 8 more to that numerator, I'd be golden. So my missing piece there is 8 over 28. Let's simplify that down. That would be, let's see, 4 over 14, or 2 sevenths. Okay, now we've completed our probability table. So now if someone asks us, well, what's the probability of pulling zero marbles? Say, well, or excuse me, zero red marbles. Say, oh, it's 15 over 28, more than 50%. All right, this is an unrelated problem. I'd like you to pause the video here and try to complete the table. I don't even care if you write it down, but I just want to do a little bit of a check-in here and see if you get how these tables work as far as that goes. So pause the video here. And what you should have come up with on this one is 0.2. That would make all these values add up to 1. Remember, if we had all the probabilities of all the outcomes together, we should always end up with 1. So that is our quick check on that. Let's continue and talk about something called expectation. Now, folks, expectation is not um, kind of like we talked about the word and and the word or. In statistics, it's not always used in the exact same way that we use it in life. Like, in life, I might say something like, well, I expect the Seahawks are going to win on Saturday or on Sunday, uh, not Saturday. But if I, if I expect the Seahawks are going to win, or, or I'm going to the uh, I'm going to the Foss basketball game, and I expect uh, that the team is going to win. So it's a little different than that. This is a numerical calculation, and it tells us the expected value of something. So we're going to do an example here uh, with the lottery, and we're going to see the expected value of a lottery ticket, and hopefully. That's more than what we paid for it. Because imagine this. If you paid $5 for a lottery ticket and its expected value is $3, you just got ripped off because you paid $5 for something that is really only worth 3 So it's going to tell us how much we would pay if the lottery or any other game were fair. So the calculation up here might look a little bit horrible. It is a capital E of X, expectation of the random variable X. It says we're going to add together what the outcome is multiplied by its probability of happening. And I've got that written right here. I think this next line is probably going to be more useful to you. The sum of the possible outcome multiplied by the probability of it happening. So here's our example, the lottery. So in our, in our situation, we have a jackpot worth $4 million, and a ticket costs $2. Hey, that's not bad. Two bucks, and you can win $4 million. That's like two million times your money. Six million people are playing, only one will win. But one person will win. Someone's going to win. What we want to know is what is the expected value for playing the game one time. And so let's do that. So let's take a look. We have to understand what our possible outcomes are. This is a pretty simple one. If you play the lottery, only two things can happen. You can win, or you can lose. So in a situation like this, it often helps me organize it if I write out what the outcomes are. I could win. Well, let's see. If I win, how much money do I get? I get $4 million. So that is the outcome on this first one. It's winning $4 million. And according to this, we have to multiply that by the probability of winning. Well, if I bought one ticket, I have one chance of winning out of 6 million people that are playing. Mm -hmm. 
It says it's a sum, so now let's talk about losing. Ha, <laughs> losing. Um, with losing, how much money do I lose when I lose? It's only two bucks. I don't pay extra money. I just lost two bucks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a negative two right here. And what's the probability of that happening? Well, if you, your chances of winning were one out of six million, we need the complement of that, what adds to one with it. So you have 5,999,999 out of a six million probability of losing. So perhaps you want to pause here and grab an Inspire and type this in. Um, I'm also going to type it in along with you here and we'll see if we can get the same thing. So, excuse me for just a moment. When I do that, I get negative one dollar and thirty-three cents. So that tells me that every time I buy a two-dollar ticket, I should expect to lose a dollar and thirty-three cents. Now here's where people get really, really confused and say, "But wait, losing a dollar and thirty-three cents is not a possible outcome." Right, it's not. You couldn't exactly lose a dollar and thirty-three cents. It's like an average. No one has to actually be average. On average, that's how much you lose because somebody wins and throws that number off. Realistically, you're probably going to lose two bucks, but the winner throws that number off. What it's saying is if you could pay a dollar and thirty-three cents for a ticket, the lottery would be fair. You'd come out even in life. I mean, uh, statistically speaking, if you played millions and millions of times. But what this is suggesting is since you're paying two dollars, and this is sixty-seven cents off that, if you played it a bazillion times, on average, when you average all those games out, you would lose sixty-seven cents per attempt. So, not a fair game. They do this on purpose, by the way. Casinos do the same thing. That's how they make money. That's how they build such nice buildings, and in some ways that's how they fund schools and public services with taxes, like the lottery. Let's continue. Let's do another example of expectation. Here's another one. You may wish to pause the game here and actually try this one on your own. In this example, we have a game that costs 75 cents to play. You flip a coin. If it comes up heads, you win two bucks. But if it comes up tails, you pay a dollar to the dealer. We want to know if this is a good financial investment. Should you play this game? And if you do, do you expect to make money? Okay, we're going to back that answer up with an expectation calculation. Once again, it's a coin flip, so we could win or we could lose. And let's look at what happens to our money if we win. If we win, we win two bucks. However, we do not get a refund on the 75 cents. So what's really happening if we win, we're not winning two dollars, we're winning a dollar and 25 cents. Now I'll write it like this, two dollars minus .75, that's what happens when you win. Probability of that happening? Looks like that's one half. What if you lose, though? If you lose, you pay an extra dollar to the dealer. What a terrible game. So the extra dollar to the dealer means you lose a dollar, but you also lose 75 cents because you're not getting a refund on that initial amount. So that's negative one dollar and 75 cents. That's what you lose, and you have a one half probability of that happening. Let's do the calculation. Let's see if this game has a positive or a negative expectation. And when I do that, I get negative 0.25. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that every time we play this game, on average, we're going to lose. So, let me give you an example. Because you can't lose 25 or 25 cents in one play of this game. I mean, you can gain $1.25 or you can lose $1.75. Those are the only two things that can happen on one play. But if we played this game a hundred times... What we would expect to happen at the end, would you expect to have more money than you started with, or less? Well, this number right here is telling us that if you played 100 times, 
on average, you're going to lose 25 cents each time. So by the time you play that many times, you will have, on average, lost about $25. It's a losing proposition. So, is this a good financial investment? Heck no. Heck to the no. Not at all. Bad idea. All right, let's do one more with a casino game. Um, these are the actual odds and the actual payouts for the game roulette. So in this example, we have a roulette wheel. You drop a ball in, the wheel spins, and it lands in one of these slots. Now, I know it's hard to see the slots going around, but they, they all have a number on them. It goes from 1 to 38. Some of them are black, some of them are red. So on here, and there's two greens as well. So two greens, 18 are black, and 18 are red. Okay? Here's how you get paid. If you bet on red or black and you win, your money gets doubled. So for example, if you bet $10, then you'll win $10 if you actually are correct on those. If you bet on a single number, like let's say you pick 17 and it lands on 17, you multiply the amount of money you had by 35. So if you bet a dollar on that number and you were right, you win $35. So what we want to know is what is a better strategy? Is it better to bet on a single number, or is it better to pick a color, and are either a fair game? So let's take a look at that. If you'd like to pause the video here and try it on your own, you'd be very welcome to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and proceed right now, though. So in order to do this, once again, we're going to consider our outcomes. Um, let's do picking a color for the first calculation. The two things that can happen is you could win, or you could lose. So if you win, you double your money. If you lose, you lose all of your money. So the way I'm going to set this up is first with the probabilities. What is the probability of winning? Well, let's say we bet on black, for example. There are 18 black spaces out of 38. So your probability of winning is 18 out of 38. And your probability of losing, well, it's the complement of that, 20 out of 38. So let's think, sometimes it helps me understand these best if we think about it in numerical terms in terms of our bets. So let's pick a simple number for this. Let's say that we bet a dollar. If we bet a dollar, when we win, it says double your money. That means we'd win one dollar. If we lose though, we lose that dollar. So our outcome is a negative one in terms of our change in our money. So now we have a relatively straightforward calculation because multiplying by one doesn't do much. What this looks like now is 18 minus 20. That's negative two over 38. Let's turn that into a decimal so we can understand it a little bit more easily. Looks like we would lose about 5.3 cents. Excuse me, that's a negative. So we would lose 5.3 cents. You say, wait, well, hey, that's not much. That's, that's not bad at all. It, it is bad, though, because people are going to play this game over and over and over and over again, and they're going to win enough to where they believe that they can. This is how they get you. And so over time, though, this guarantees the roulette game will make money for the owner of the game, in this case, probably a casino. So that's the outcome for betting on a color. Let's do the outcome now for betting on a number. Okay, so, let's take a look. In terms of betting on a number, what's the probability that you're going to get it right? Your probability of a win. Well, you've picked one number out of the 38, so that's your probability of winning. Your probability of losing is the complement, 37 out of 38. And let's figure out what you win when you do that. You get 35 times your money. But, guys, notice right here, I put a 1. Well, why did I do that? Because you put your dollar down, you get your dollar back and one more. That doubled your money. So if you get one extra dollar, that doubled. You're getting 35 times your money on this one, but one of those dollars, if we bet a dollar, one of those dollars is the dollar you bet. It was already yours. So you're only winning $34. It's a little bit deceptive. So you're winning $34. If you lose, you're still only losing that one dollar. So let's see what this is. That looks like 34 out of 38 minus 37 out of 38. So that is a negative 3 out of 38. So we can see right away, that's a worse outcome 
then the negative 2 out of 38. Let's turn it into a decimal so we can understand what it is. And that looks like we would expect to lose about 8 cents on average per play. So which one's a better bet? Well, betting on a color is a better bet because you don't lose as much when you do that. Are either of them fair? No, they're both negative. That's terrible. You don't want to play games that have a negative expectation. That means you would expect statistically that on average you're going to lose money. We don't want to play those games. All right, so now let's get into some of the types of questions that IB would normally ask us. And this is a really standard example. They give us a random variable x. They say it can only take on values of 1, 2, and 3. 3 is twice as likely as 1 or 2. 1 and 2 are equally likely. We need to find the expectation of x. We can do this uh, sort of intuitively. To me, the easiest way to do it is to make one of those distribution tables. Right, and so I've got my outcome, the probability of that outcome, and we list the outcomes out as 1, 2, and 3. And so I want to write down symbolically what they told us. They said that, that 3 is twice as likely Andre, as Gary, 1 or 2. And so if 3 is twice as likely, I'm just going to say it's double the probability of those. 1 and 2 are equally likely, so they have some probability. 3 is twice as likely. And we know that all three of these add up to 1. So, with that, we have p plus p plus 2p equals 1. Add them together, that's 4p equals 1. Divide by 4, and p equals 1 fourth. So with that done, now we can go ahead and just plug in our numbers. Now I'm going to erase the stuff that I put in there. If you want to erase, write next to it, write a new table, whatever works for you is good for me. But I'm going to plug those in. So that's 1 fourth. 1 fourth, and remember this one was twice as much, so double that, that's a half. And now those add up to 1. Now, they also asked us for the expectation of x. And so this is more of a standard IB type of an exercise. All we have to do, remember, is take each outcome, in our previous examples, winning or losing, in this example, the outcomes are 1, 2, and 3, and we have to multiply those by their probabilities. So here's all we have to do for the expectation. We're going to take our outcomes. Our first outcome is 1. We're going to multiply it by its probability of 1 fourth. And notice, these are the exact same symbols in the definition of expectation. Now we're going to go to the next one. 2 times its probability, 1 fourth. Plus 3 times its probability of happening, 1 half. And we can probably do this without a calculator, I'm thinking. So let's do it. So that's 1 fourth. That's 2 fourths. And this is 3 halves. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite 3 halves in terms of fourths. So I'm going to rewrite that as 6 fourths, just so that it's easier to add these together. So I have 1 plus 2 plus 6, I think that's 9, that's 9 fourths as an expectation of the discrete random variable x. Now, 9 fourths we know to be 2.25. Y'all, I realize that you can't actually get a 2.25. But look, this one half right here in the probability distribution is skewing this to the right because the 3 is more likely than the 1, which means the expectation isn't 2, it's shifted more toward 3, and we can see that down here with that 2.25. Right, we got our last example here. Now we're going to get to work on our assignment. All right, and then here's another standard example of an IB type of an exercise. Okay, in this example, we have a discrete random variable x. It has a probability distribution given by a formula this time. And one thing I want you to see right away, I want you to write it down too, I want you to see that there's two variables in this. Yikes! Actually, it's not going to be that bad. Over here, they're telling us x, all the possible outcomes, here they are. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are the only things that can happen. So, guess what we have to do? We're going to make a table. So, here we go. I'm going to make my table. There's x probability that x equals whatever, and I'll put in my outcomes, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, in order to do this, because this is a formula that says the probability of x being whatever it is, is this formula, we have to actually plug in these numbers for each spot. So when I have x is 1, 
I plug in a 1 right here. So that means 1 over, do you know what k is? Because I don't. So I'm going to leave it as k. 1 over k. Let's go to the next one. The next one says plug in a 2. x is 2. So the next one is 2 over k. Final or third one, plug in a 3. That's 3 over k. And that's 4 over k. So don't stop here because those haven't really answered the question yet. We have to figure out what k is. That's so what it's asking for right here after all. So look at this. What do you know about these four numbers? I hope what you know is that they have to add up to 1 because those are the probabilities of these events. So we're going to add them up. 1 over k plus 2 over k plus 3 over k plus 4 over k and that has to add up to 1. So let's add them up. 1 plus 2 is 3. Add 3 more to that, you get 6. Add 4 more to that, you get 10. This is 10 over k equals 1, and therefore, k equals 10. So now that I know that k equals 10, I can go right back up into this table. I can erase all those k's, or you can write next to it if you want. I'm going to erase the k's for mine. And then we know that k is 10. So each of those is over 10. That is the number for k that makes them all add up. So we've answered this question. What's the value of k? k equals 10. Now we're being asked to find the expectation. So I would suggest that you pause here and try this one on your own, then play the video and check in with me and see how you did. Um, I'm going to walk through it now either way. So whatever you choose, that's on you. Let's do it. As far as expectation of x, all we're going to do is we're going to plug in exactly what the formula says. Take the outcome, multiply by the probabilities. So that's going to look like this. 1 times its probability of a tenth, plus 2 times its probability of 2 tenths, plus 3 times its probability of 3 tenths. Oops, looks like I'm out of space. Don't know if you know this. It's just like writing a book. If you run out of space, you go to the next line. Plus 4 times 4 tenths. And I haven't simplified these. Now, one of the reasons I haven't simplified them is because now I have a common denominator. And it didn't ask me for the table. The table is not part of the answer. The table is just to help me answer the questions. So in this instance, it doesn't benefit me to simplify those. I think we're going to see that right here now. So let's go ahead and simplify these out. 1 over 10, well that didn't change it, so that's just 1 over 10. This turns into a 4 over 10. This turns into a 9 over 10. And this turns into a 16, oops, make that look like a 10. 16 over 10, and they're all added together. Let's do a little bit of addition. The way my mind works on this, I put the 4 and the 16 together, it's 20. I put the 9 and the 1 together, that's 10. That gives me 30, unless I've screwed something up, over 10, which is 3. So my expectation for this random variable x is 3. Before we conclude, we got one more thing. There's going to be a piece of vocab that pops up in your assignment today. It's going to use the word tabulate. And so that's something that I don't think we've ever talked before. When you're asked to tabulate, what do you think that means? In the same way that calculate means like come up with a number for the answer, tabulate means make a table to represent the situation. Your answer will be the table. So I'm going to add that up here. Tabulate means simply make a table. Okay, So you're going to need to know that in order to get through the assignment today. So enjoy that. Um, I do have printed out handouts with the assignment and the answers are on them, so please make sure you grab one. Um, and if there's any time remaining, please use the time to work on that and work together and help each other out. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye now.